Well, thank you so much uh, uh, for agreeing to talk with me. Thank you for the invitation. We should probably start with mm -hmm. the with my Joe Simone question. Joe said, if you've seen one cancer center, you've seen one cancer center. Uh, what is uh, Hawaii? We're the only cancer center 2,400 miles away from, you know, the closest cancer center in the West Coast. So we're geographically isolated. But the other uniqueness is a population that we serve and we have no majority among the race and ethnicity. Geographically, we're really isolated and ethnicity that's contributing to the type of the disease that we see. Lifestyle is different, culture is different. And it's, uh, you have pretty much the largest uh, uh, catchment area, larger than the United States. That's correct. It covers the entire West Pacific, uh, and these are all uh, U.S. territory, or we have a, a alliance with a government that allows to work together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But this is this must create some problems in terms of access. Oh, we have a huge access uh, issue, uh, and the the issue that we face is that. It's not just access, but the resource availability is very different. Uh, so for, uh, and the way I describe is uh, there's uh, four tiers of health disparity that we have. Or East Oahu is pretty much what, you know, like what we see in the mainland. Still kind of challenging, but that's what we see. Once we go to the North Oahu or the West Oahu, then the, uh, suddenly we have more native Hawaiian and we have access issue. And then the neighbor island like Maui, big island, um, there's limited number of medical oncologists. So if you have any kind of a treatment, they have to fly over to Oahu. Uh, standard care you know, could be given, but it's somewhat limited. And then the rest, which is really, they have no medical oncologists, they may not even have a capability to do screening. So there's a really significant depletion of resource in the area. So I'm not gonna say it's not available, but it is extremely challenging. So you can see that you know the more far you out of Oahu, everything gets challenging in terms of resource and access. Well, uh, Dr. Rana, what what about how do you deal with it? How what's so our strategy for a long time has been to understand uh, the risk factor that's related in this area because obesity and some of the culture such as uh, beetle nut chewing has increased uh, significantly in certain type of cancer. So education and lifestyle modification is uh, really the uh, cornerstone of what we have been doing in this area. It's simply not for me to say, okay, well, I'm gonna build a new clinic in this area is nothing is not feasible. I mean, it's, we have to really help people to be more aware about uh, improving their lifestyles, diet, and prevent the cancer as much as possible, and and try to establish screening. And that's really what the area is in this uh, what we call the U.S. affiliated Pacific Island for neighbor island. It's really more about uh, developing statewide uh, education and, and make sure that people who are practicing a neighbor island has uh, information that they need. And, and also we are just in the process of trying to get more clinical trials in, uh, into these islands. Well, what is beetle nut chewing? I mean? Well, it's an addiction of, it's like a tobacco chewing type of a practice that exists in the entire Pacific. I mean, it's not unique to the our catchment area. So this is really on the old days that even the parents was recommending the kids to chew this. So it results in head and neck cancer, thoracic cancer, and it's it's a big issue uh, in the 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 Pacific area. How do you fight that? 
like I say, it's really about beetle nut is not something that we don't recommend for kids. We don't even recommend for adults and it's a trigger of uh, cancer. So it's really about like uh, same thing as like tobacco cessation approach. And, and we've been fairly successful uh, providing this information, but it, it's just not, it's different because each of the culture have a, uh, different needs. Uh, they have a different way of how they get the information and what they believe is really uh, truthful. We may not always have the trust uh, for these people. So it's really important to always work with the community leaders uh, or it could be the church uh, leaders to explain the you know, why we're trying to reach out and you know, how we're trying to help rather than simply just giving a brochure and believing that they're going to do something about it. I mean, it's much more effective for providing broader like social media information, probably like in the main mainland, uh, but it's not going to work in this area. Uh, it's a very tight, you know, community. Uh, there has been, for, na for like Native Hawaiian, there's a strong distrust uh, among, uh, uh, you know, like people coming from the mainland and or Western type of approach. So community outreach is really our really uh, treasure of our cancer center. I know that currently the can uh, NCI focus on community outreach and engagement, but traditionally over, you know, our cancer center has been focusing doing this for, you know, half a decade, I mean, half a century. So that's really where the driving force of our activity is. Yes. Wow. Well, this must make for some really cool science. Yes. Uh, so our strength, one of the uh, premier research ongoing is the population science. And we have uh, uh, long decades, a couple of decades of what we call the multi-ethnic cohort and I believe, I have to check the number again, but I, the sample, the biological sample collection is close to 200,000, 250,000 sample. And this is a endeavor with a USC working together. But that multi-ethnic cohort uh, with a different ethnicity allows us to really understand the risk that's related to cancer occurrence or risk that would uh, trigger the acceleration of disease. And uh, that's really one of our strengths. And yeah. Could we talk about the structure in terms of the business structure? How, how, how do you hire people? How do you, uh, whom do you work with? Is it a consortium? How does it work? Right. So <clears throat> we're a standalone cancer center. Uh, so so the hiring of the scientists or uh, some of the clinician is directly uh, through the cancer center. But that said, for the clinicians, it's a really um, collaboration with the consortium and it's called the Hawaii Cancer Consortium. Hawaii Cancer Consortium is a very unique and uh, really a strong uh, opportunity for us because uh, it's made up of four healthcare system uh, and one uh, insurance, HMSA, uh, which is like a Blue Cross and Blue Shields of uh, Hawaii, and the medical school, and the uh, UH Manoa, University of Hawaii Manoa, which is uh, the major university system. So <clears throat> when we look for, uh, particularly for like clinicians, uh, uh, because our practice is in the, com with four healthcare system, Queens and uh, Hawaii Pacific Health, uh, some of the employment process really goes from the cancer center and some will be hired by them, but their FTE is assigned to us. That must be very challenging. Uh, no, I mean, when we have a candidate, so let's say I identify a candidate, I just, just you know, send a blast email. I mean, the blast email is not appropriate, but I, you know, basically I have this candidate and then this is what we're looking for, you know, and that determines, you know, who will raise hand. So sometimes they will compete. Sometimes it's only one 
side will be interested. And sometimes it's our interest more than them. So therefore, we have a way to uh, create a practice. You know, we could assign uh, the clinical activities. So it's kind of complex. It is. It took a long time for me to understand. This is a reality that we face, particularly with a uh, area like underserved community and community setting. So I know it's complex, but <clears throat> I, pre I appreciate what it is. And uh, everybody has a stake. And I think it's my job to really make sure that uh, whoever we hire really serves everybody. And then you know, our cancer center is really focusing on translation of our discovery to the community. So it's just that that's how it was set up with my predecessor. I think it's a reason, reasonable setup and, and my job is to optimize this more. And as we go into like a, doing a more phase one type of a phase one type of clinical trials. And so, yes. Well, it's interesting about phase one. You're starting that. That's in a, in a very complex system. How is that uh, working out? I, it's working out uh, good, and the plan it's the plan is moving, and uh, the construction is ongoing. Uh, we expect to finish the construction this year. The operation we expect in two thousand twenty five. So. We have strong support from the healthcare system. So now we're at the phase of how do we operate uh, working with uh, particularly the two major healthcare system, which is HPH and Queens and staffing, budgeting, downstream revenue, multiple thing needs to be sorted out. And the good thing is we have a very strong relationship among at the highest level so we have an open business discussion ongoing. So the Cancer Center has been working with a consortium of uh, running a phase one, and, and we're centralizing many of the clinical trials. We have opened one phase one study uh, la late last year, and we enrolled, I think, seven or eight patients very quickly, and we out, you know, performed. Uh, so, uh, you know, the expectations. So, so we're actually in the middle of training to make sure that we could open phase one and we have staff to run these clinical trials. Uh, uh, well, Dr. Renner, you mentioned uh, the, uh, you, you mentioned MD Anderson. That's where you're, you came from. Can we talk about your kind of the history and your interest and in, with what <laughs> academic interests, your clinical interests? So, so I was there for close to 30 years. I uh, did my fellowship. Um, you know, my career is somewhat complex because uh, I went doing my fellowship. I went back to the University of Texas Graduate School of Biomedical Science because I was interested in biology. So I got a PhD for cancer biology while I was a faculty. And that time, Anderson was not hiring a lot of people. And I was also interested in stem cell transplant in breast cancer. So I went into Department of Stem Cell Transplantation under Dr. Champlin. And I was a breast med onc as a stem cell transplant physician for a while. But as you know, the, the world has collapsed with fraud committed by uh, South Africa and the field collapsed. And meanwhile, Dr. Gabe Horovaji asked me to develop the, the laboratory activity of the breast medical oncology. And eventually I was asked by Wang Ki Han to move to Department of Breast Medical Oncology. And I moved to Breast Medical Oncology and I was always interested in aggressive breast cancer. And, and everybody was engaged with so many different disease. And the only thing that was left was inflammatory breast cancer provided by Dr. Christopher Nally. So, I went into doing more clinical studies and trying to understand the biology of inflammatory breast cancer in lab. And my R01 is related into this area. And so that's how I, de how I developed my uh, career over there. And one thing I learned from this is that, of course, I learned about administration skill as a, eventually as a director of the uh, Morgan Welch Inflammatory Breast Cancer Research and Clinic. 
And I was always saying towards the end of my uh, tenure over there as a director, I need to provide to make sure that any kind of care could be provided at any location because most of the like inflammatory breast cancer, which is a rare type of breast cancer, if you come to MD Anderson, absolutely we they could or we were able to provide excellent care. But most people can't come to MD Anderson. And that was really, it was really hitting my mind. And of course, I was seeking for new opportunity for uh, see whether my leadership could, you know, develop. But that was probably the driving force to jump off of MD Anderson and come to a very different setting, 180 degree setting. I think people would so I was going to retire and be on the beach and drinking Mai Tai. <laughs> but uh, I came here to really serve this community under very uh, challenging situation and to see that whether I could provide a reasonable care. And, and what I'm trying to say is people who are rich on, in, in this area, they could fly to like MD Anderson, UCLA, or uh, Fred Hutch, or any of these large centers. But yeah, you have to remember that socioeconomically, most people is not rich. Even if they're able to go one time, they can't stay in the area. So, so I'd like to make this impact by, of course, research driving clinical care and prevention so that nobody has to leave the island. And that's what I'm, you know, my driving force and I'm going to try to make this cancer center to go to that direction. With all these tr distances that people have to travel, um, how do you get around that? Yeah, so um, we, as you said, we have a major uh, access issue and, and not that all care could be provided on neighbor highlands. So we are the epic center of providing the highest quality of care in Oahu. But when they come here, they need place to stay. They also need peer support. And this is where Hope Lodge, uh, supported by ACS, is, has a tremendous impact. And because as you know that many of the hotel here is extremely expensive because it's driven by tourism, but this is where ACS provide a, uh, a place to stay, place to meet others and place to meet, you know, ACS members. And they are, you know, constantly working with us, how, you know, how we could provide the best care. So, you know, uh, we appreciate what the ACS, you know, uh, provides. And ACS not only work with us, but ACS work with the healthcare system so that we could give them a, the most optimal care. Because sometimes they have to go back and forth for their uh, every three week treatment or weekly treatment. So, Dr. Ryan, you're also one of the few NCI designated cancer center directors uh, who is a cancer survivor and twice right. cancer survivor. Also, uh, uh, also, you've been through a phase one program. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> right. I mean, I think I'm one of the few that disclose I have cancer and I have been very candid yeah. about my previous treatment. And what I could say is I truly appreciate the advancement of cancer research, every bit of it. And so I'll just give you this. So I have myoli dysplastic syndrome and also I had sarcoma. And, but the MDS was the most toughest one. As you know, MDS is not curable in a sense. Uh, so I did go to phase one study with a I think it was IDH12 inhibitor. Uh, I think IDH12. And, and um, because I had a mutation in uh, MDS, uh, it turns out it didn't work. But still, you know, I got that opportunity. And uh, so it didn't work, but uh, I was really happy about it. And then I went through transplant and I received Hudervi and Busafon. I uh, I received intravenous busulfan, but now looking back, when I actually started as a transplant physician, I was a one of the clinical investigator with uh, 
because uh, IB Buselkin was developed at MD Anderson, uh, one of the investigators. So I was part of the investigator. And so now it's a standard care, right? So so I got IB Buselkin, you know, the clinical studies, I was, you know, part of it. And so it's amazing, you know, otherwise I will be taking a pill of uh, Buselkin and vomiting, potential vomiting. So it's just that, Every, I'm here because of all these trials and somebody who had done the research. So I, I have this strong appreciation that I strongly believe that research does make a big difference. Uh, sometimes it's not immediate, but uh, that's what it takes. And um, I think people in the, the community I serve is completely depleted from these kind of advanced treatment. And that's something that I really like to make a difference. How did you decide to come to Hawaii and when? Let's just kind of talk the time frame a little bit. So I was, so I, I had been recruited by my predecessor, you know, the previous directors. And also I've been going to Hawaii for a long time. So it was an area that I kind of knew you know, in terms of community to a certain sense. So what drive me to going, well, I mean, you know, so I started my job in December of 2022. And it turns out that, you know, the, there was a, in the past 10 years, I think we had two directors and two interims, so, or three interims. So I, you know, when the opportunity came around uh, probably early 2022 or late 2021, because of, like I told you that I was uh, really wanted to address this um, quality of care, regardless of the location, I thought maybe, yeah, I should give it, you know, apply and see what happens. And, you know, it was a competitive process and, turns out that I got selected so when did you uh when did you take this job and when is your uh, um, next renewal <laughs> so I took this job on December 12 2022 the renewal is actually this moment so um we submitted the application in September and then uh we we will have a site visit on February the 28th so as a first year um, director, I had a very steep learning curve. <laughs> and I think we, I think I had a good team and people has, you know, with me to really understand what CCSG P30 is about. So <clears throat> it was about learning the cancer center, learning the community, and then learning about how P30 will function. So yeah, it's, it's been a tough, you know, <laughs> tough year. It's looking good. It's looking good, you know. You know, I was given a chance to wait another year, but uh, I think uh, at the same time we had a very motivated uh, team, faculty. All our team said, "Let's go for it." So, uh, with understanding what's going on and the motivation already that existed to submit. It really, I just said, okay, we'll submit, you know, during the first year. Mm -hmm. So you could have had an extension, but you didn't need it. That's correct. Yes. Wow. And the EAB is very enthusiastic about. about that's correct. So that's a good question you're asking. The, that's right. Um, so we did consult EAC. So that I came in December and the EAC was January, right? And so I presented, you know, did my best. <clears throat> and then. <laughs> there was an additional, you know, understanding about the, our effort of improving our clinical trial accrual and structure because the structure was not good. Not, well, not, not optimal is a better way of saying. And so we, the consortium, we work aggressively from March. And then after March, we got a okay from EAC, I think April, May, uh, the EAC gave a, you know, 
<clears throat> said, you guys are doing great and you are really improving, you know, uh, in terms of how we're going to, you know, address clinical care and clinical trials. So we got an okay and that okay went to NCI. And so then NCI also okayed for us to let's go for it. Well, this is also a kind of place that you would think NCI really needs to have in its portfolio. And, you know, the EAB understands that. I mean, they knowing the history prior to you, the EAB has been very helpful in keeping keeping things going um, and for vouching and making, giving, giving another chance. And now we might be, you know, leadership matters to quote Joe Simone. You might be, we might be in a very different place, mm -hmm. but do you get kind of an enthusiasm from NCI? Do you get that feel of it? Yes, definitely. I mean, uh, so as you just mentioned, the uh, EAC under, uh, recently George Weiner and uh, and Karen Knanson. Every step on the way, if you look the historical for the past uh, 10 years, I think uh, historically we are making our <clears throat> improvement. And so now we have a very uh, well-organized, structured, um, uh, uh, basically the organization and stability. And I'm actually coming in to really take this organization, working with a team to uh, make this more uh, engagement of the community and then really giving a structure so that, as I said, ultimately we don't have to have people to leave the island and 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 that's and then when I say leaving the island, it's not just about clinical or clinical affair. I'm talking about you know clinical trials, uh, research mechanistically, population science. All of these is going to really important. So it is we are the so, so if you look at like a trial accrual, eighty percent, seventy five to eighty percent is. Uh, minorities, and and we are the only cancer center in the United States that we could enrich Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander, and and it is very important for the federal side, and um, for even for drug development, DEI needs to be addressed. FDA have a strong interest in uh, NHPI and AA. So what I'm facing personally is we have many pharmaceutical companies who wants to come to this area. So I'm trying to really find this right balance so that one, it's about discovery. And then second, it's about intervention. And then, but it's not just about what we do, but how does this link to our complex community, which has a health disparity? So we want to be a health disparity as a theme driving and simultaneously embracing our culture and diversity. So in the sense of the question you first asked about, you know, are we unique? Well, we're extremely unique to comparing to most other cancer center. And I think there's a, a value that NCI or not just NCI, but there's a general value that comes from many different entity, both uh, government or uh, even from the private sector. Mm -hmm. And that's that's one of the reasons you started the phase one program. That's correct. I mean, the phase one program is one to really give them access uh, to our population. That's one. But the second is we really need to understand the drug metabolism and different type of uh, genomic landscape, what are they? And, and so that we could uh, provide uh, ethnicity or race uh, personalized uh, treatment in the future. How many patients do you, do you treat every year? Well, our catchment area covers about 1.9 million. And annually, I believe it's about 8,000 patients uh, happens and uh, they're treated somewhere. 
our uh, consortium covers about 75 to 80 percent of the population. So 6,000 or so patients pass through, new patients. That's correct, yes. I see. And and really, everybody goes through the cancer center, right? There's no... Well, everybody goes through the healthcare system. The cancer center is not a, a hospital or clinic, unless in the future, we will have the phase one on the camp, campus. So, so that's a game changer. Currently, if our... Uh, what we call the academic clinical investigator will go to like Queens or HPH to practice. So I practice as a breast medical oncologist in Queens and HPH. I guess what kind of is amazing to me is, is that you haven't had sort of a massive transformational grant from somebody like, I don't know, Oprah Winfrey, who seems to have a Hawaii connection. Um, what, is this is one of the places where there's a naming opportunity you would think absolutely we are definitely looking for people who are interested in cancer center and we do have the naming opportunity exist and and i do recognize my job is to reach out to the community it's really uh there's two type of community that exists in our area. One is really people who are embedded and who's been here and born and raised, and that's a tight network community that exists. And the second is these uh fairly uh wealthy people coming to and live here and they appreciate uh, where they li live here. So that's where, you know, I have to really make more effort to meet these people so that uh, they could understand um, what is happening. Uh, it's not just about asking for money, but trying to really give them the landscape of healthcare, including cancer, that what we have here. This is something that is a general challenge that, we, you know, I've been working on because many of the uh, people who see Hawaii and U.S., you know, this beautiful area, they they see very gorgeous hotels and really nice restaurants. And, but that is not, that is one part of our area. But if you actually look from more of a broader, larger uh, scope, we have a major socioeconomical challenges, which is poverty, healthcare access issue that, most tourists don't see and it's not that we want to prom you know that's that, that's not that you know i i don't want people to feel that you know hawaii is a terrible place i mean hawaii is a beautiful place so we'd like more people to come because that's our business drive but at the same time i want people to understand the challenge that we have and we need help from mainland and um help from many many people so that and then when we talk about the Pacific, Pacific is not only U.S. influence, it's influence from Asia, it's influence from Australia. So there's a large population that who is completely forgotten because uh, internationally, we have never really tightly collaborated of how to address cancer prevention, cancer care. So I do see in the near future that I will need to start addressing this was working with my international partner, not just uh, uh, us saying focusing on our area because there are many other islands that we don't even, you know, uh, get involved. I mean, we do communicate, but we need to do a better job. Yeah, but from what you've just told me, you're 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 building a better case for they ask for more resources. It becomes clearer with what you've been do doing. It's right. so- Absolutely, we we need resource. Uh, um, I think we've done a great job up to here and um, we do like to get more support from our local government. Um, we appreciate the support from the healthcare, but as we, show our productivity, we do like to get more help from the healthcare system. But still, I think there is a challenge. I mean, this is not Texas, right? So, uh, so, so asking for really uh, philanthropic uh, 
uh, funding to the cancer center, and particularly like you just brought up, naming opportunity really is a game changer that would allow us to take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and now you have a better case for it. Right. And, you know, what we all feel is our discovery is not just focus on Hawaii. What we could, what we learn from here helps all the Asian in United States. We have more native Hawaiian off the, you know, the, the island. They, they live in mainland more than here. What we do definitely is very helpful for the entire United States and the world is the way we see it. So, you know, it's not just local folk focus. And I, I think it's a, area it's worth investing for uh, pharmaceutical as well as federal is, is the way we see it. Uh, mm -hmm. When you decided to take this job, did you have to buy Hawaiian shirts or did you buy them once you got there? I did have some Aloha, I mean, these shirts, you know, Aloha shirts and then, uh, but I start to learn that there are certain type of pattern that I should be wearing doing the job so i you know of course there's these um sometimes you go to waikiki they have like a hawaiian girls or you know <laughs> pineapple and but that's not the kind of a shirt that you want to wear in business yes uh these shirts are uh our business attire it's appropriate i mean this is not you know native hawaiian culture it really was uh really embedded by in the old days, uh, my understanding, the Japanese people came and they was using kimono and they would took kimono and then ch changed to a shirt. And that's really how it got started. But we like to embrace culture. And then the other thing is uh, University of Hawaii embraces Hawaiian languages. So, um, so we, you know, we try to use native Hawaiian languages appropriately, not that I could speak the language, but there's a uh, Hawaii, has two official languages, English and Hawaiian. And um, and this is in any even kind of governmental activities, they will use two languages. And for us, uh, we try to understand the cultures. We use aloha, mahalo, and, um, and try to, you know, when we write emails or when we try to say hello to everybody, or aloha means hi, and also aloha has meaning goodbye. As aloha is really appreciation for your friendship. And then, uh, so um, the goal for us is to embrace the culture, not just native Hawaiian, but all the cultures that exist. And so that's very unique here, actually, yeah. Is there anything I forgot to ask? No, you ask, uh, you covered everything in it. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. Mahalo for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Wena.